God bless you. Always a joy to come into your homes. And if you're ever in our area, please stop by and be a part of one of our services. I promise you we'll make you feel right at home. But thanks so much for tuning in, and thank you again for coming out today. I like to start with something funny. And I heard about this minister. He bought a new horse. He trained it to respond to praise the Lord, meaning giddy up, and hallelujah, meaning woe. Every time he said praise the Lord, the horse took off running. When he said hallelujah, it quickly stopped. One day he was out riding, and the horse got spooked, took off straight toward the cliff, going full blast. In the panic, he couldn't remember what he taught the horse. He said, bless God, amen, glory, nothing happened. The last second, he shouted, hallelujah. The horse came to a screeching halt just inches from the edge of the cliff. He breathed a sigh of relief and said, praise the Lord. <laughs> All right. Hold up your Bible. Say it like you mean it. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, God bless you. I want to talk to you today about giving the gift of yourself. The greatest gift you can give is not necessarily your money. It's not what you can buy someone. The greatest gift is your time, your attention, your love, your concern. When you take time to go see someone, you look them in the eyes, they feel your love. They enjoy your company. That means more than any material gift that you could ever give. And the people that are close to you, that really love and respect you, they would rather have you than your money. You can give them all the money in the world, but if you're not spending time with them, they're missing out on the best of you. When you give the gift of yourself, you're saying you're extremely important to me. I care about you. I love you. You're valuable. You're giving something that money cannot buy. And sometimes writing a check is taking the easy way out. I know I need to go visit my parents, but I'm so busy at the office, I'll just pay the neighbor to watch after them. My friend's in the hospital. I know I should go see them, but I don't want to miss working out this week. I'll just send them some flowers. Now take time to give your greatest gift. I learned this from my father. At least once a year, he would have me drive him back to Paris, Texas. That's where he grew up. And there was this older couple that was related to us somehow. And the man was American Indian, so nice. And his wife and him, they lived in this small wood frame house. And they were in their late 80s and had some health issues and didn't have much money, didn't have anybody to watch after them. And my father would pay their rent, buy their medications, have somebody take care of the house. Daddy could have thought, that's good enough. I'm doing my part. No, he understood this principle, that the greatest gift he could give was not his money, but himself. And my father was very busy, pastored a large church, had a lot of responsibilities. This could have been very low on his priority list, but every year we would take that five-hour journey. First time we went, I told Victoria, next Tuesday, we're going to Paris. Didn't tell her Paris, Texas until the morning of. <laughs> we got to Paris, and she never did find the Eiffel Tower there, but I'll never forget pulling up in their driveway. They were sitting on the front porch, waiting with such anticipation. You would have thought the President of the United States showed up. They were so happy. We'd go in and eat the lunch they had prepared. Then we would sit there and visit for hours and hours, listening to their stories, the same ones I'd heard before. A couple times I thought, let me finish it for you. <laughs> I was in my early 20s. To be honest, I was so bored. I thought, come on, Daddy, let's go. We've had lunch. We said hello. They know we love them. My father sat there just as patient as can be. What was he doing? giving his greatest gift, his time, his attention, his friendship, the gift of himself. And today, people are so busy. With the technology, it's easy to not interact one-on-one. -on -one. Where we used to go see someone in person, or we used to at least pick up the phone, now we may go months and months and only communicate by text, by email, by Facebook. And there's nothing wrong with that, 
but you have to make sure you're not cheating people out of the best of you. To look someone in the eyes is very powerful. To give them your undivided attention speaks volumes. To let them hear your voice is extremely important. You will never regret spending time with the people that you love. Now, I'm all for using technology, but nothing makes the impact like seeing someone face to face. There was this older gentleman that I grew up with, and he was always very good to me. He bought some television equipment for us, just a kind, generous man. He'd come up to the office and bring lunch, and we'd all sit around, laugh, talk, have a good time together. One day, he had a stroke. Couldn't get out anymore. He couldn't drive. and I felt so badly for him. I meant to call him. I had good intentions, but I was so busy. We had a newborn little baby daughter. I was just learning how to minister. Had so much going on, I kept putting it off and putting it off. Now, I know friends that would go out to see him, and I'd always tell them, be sure to tell him for me that I miss him. I love him, and I'm going to come see him. Well, weeks turned into months. Months turned into years. And one morning, I woke up with him on my mind so strongly that I got in the car and drove to his house. And the lady that took care of him answered the door. She said, Joel, he is going to be so happy to see you. He talks about you all the time. He tells people you're just like his own son. I went in and gave him a big hug, and he wept and wept. And we're all busy. We've all got a lot going on. But I'll never regret the time that I spent with him that day. That one hour did more to express my love, my gratitude, my respect, than a thousand people telling him for me. I could have sent him money, food, medication, encouragement. That would have been good. He would have been grateful. But it would not have had half the impact of that one visit. The fact that I took time to look him in the eyes, to let him feel the warmth of my hug, to give him my undivided attention, to laugh and talk about old times, that was invaluable. That cannot be purchased by money. Why is that? The greatest gift you can give is yourself. You can't do it for everyone, but you can do it for someone. God has put people in your life that need your gift. Don't put it off and say, oh yeah, Joel, I'll do it. One day when it slows down at the office, Maybe when the children get back in school. Maybe when the price of gas comes down. Don't hold your breath. If you keep putting it off, you may miss the opportunity. Life is short. There's no guarantee of another day. That visit you've been planning to make, why don't you make it? That friend you've been meaning to see, why don't you go see them? When I left his house that morning, part of me felt very happy and very fulfilled that I could make his day. Another part of me felt sad that I'd held my gift back for so long. It had been years I had been planning to see him, to see the impact that it made, to see him come alive, to see his smile, made me wish I'd done it a whole lot sooner. I made a vow that day that I wasn't going to withhold my gift anymore. I'm asking you to do the same thing. Take time for the people that invested in you, the people that made sacrifices, like this man, the people that went out of their way to be good to you. They need more than your money, more than your well wishes, more than your friends saying hello for you. They need the gift of yourself. Here's the key. Only you can give it. Your love, your smile, your friendship, your gratitude, that's one of a kind. Can't be transferred. Doesn't necessarily translate through another person, through a letter. A phone call's good, but don't use that as an excuse to never see them face to face. Tell you something strange about me. There's more than one thing, but this is one. <laughs> when I read the newspaper every morning, I always read the obituaries. I scan through it, read about people, to see who they are, what their story is, how long they've lived. My children still make fun of me. Daddy's reading the obituaries again. 
starting the day off right, thinking about death. <laughs> but I've done that for years and years. I think the main reason is to make sure I'm not in it. <laughs> but the real main reason is it reminds me of how fragile life really is. We grow up thinking that we're invincible. We're going to be here forever with our family and our friends. Our world is always going to be perfect. That's not the case. James 4.14 says, Our life is like a mist. We're here for a moment, then we're gone. When you read the obituaries, you see people who were old and people who were young. People who had big families and people with no families. Some obituaries are very long with great accomplishments. Some are short. They just list the people's name and their dates, their age. One thing they all have in common is they're no longer here. Their time on this earth is over. And it's very sobering to look around at who God has put in your life. Who has made a difference? Who has invested in you? Who was there when nobody else was around? They took you under their wing. They mentored you. Are you giving the gift of yourself back to them? Some people come into our lives to get us to a certain level. They make sacrifices. They pay the price. Then we take off and pass them by. Now they're in the shadows. It's easy to forget about them. It's easy to not have any time. Too busy, too important, too successful. I've got too much going on. No, if it had not been for them, you wouldn't be where you are. Take time for the people that took time for you. When my father was in high school, he had a friend named Sam Martin. Sam was always talking to him about the Lord and how he needed to give his life to Christ. My father always thought Sam was a little odd, too religious. Sam would get to school early in the morning and write scriptures on the chalkboard. Most of the students agreed with my father that Sam was just too far out. Well, one night at 2 o'clock in the morning, my father was walking home from a nightclub, 17 years old. He began to think about his eternal destiny. He got home and opened the family Bible on the coffee table. It was just there as decoration. My father had no kind of spiritual upbringing, never been to church before. The Bible fell open to a picture of Jesus knocking at a door. The caption read, I stand at the door and knock. If any person opens the door, I will come in. My father couldn't understand religion, but he could understand opening a door. The next day, he told Sam what had happened. Sam said, John, that's God drawing you unto himself. He invited my father to church. They went and sat on the very back row. At the end of the service, the minister invited people to the altar to receive Christ. My father wouldn't go. He was too scared. Sam whispered in his ear, 17 years old, John, if you'll walk down there, I'll go with you. That day, they both walked down there. My father gave his life to Christ, and Daddy went on to become a very well-respected, successful minister, founded this church. But here's my point. Sam didn't have that same success. He pastored a church here and there, but nothing really caught on. Later in Sam's life, everything had gone downhill. He was really struggling, working as a greeter at a local retail store. He and my father had stayed in touch somewhat, but not that close. They would call each other every several years. When my father heard how much Sam was struggling, he got in his car and he drove to Dallas to visit. Now they were both in their 70s. Sam was so thrilled. He couldn't believe his old high school friend John had taken time to come. My dad was very loyal. He invited Sam to be a part of our staff as one of our ministers. And Sam and his wife moved to Houston. And Sam spent the last eight years of his life working with my father day in and day out. What was my dad doing? Giving the gift of himself. He knew he wouldn't be here if it weren't for Sam. Sam was there for my father in his time of need. Now my father was there for Sam in Sam's time of need. Don't forget about the people that help you get to where you are. Don't be too busy, too important. Take time to reach back 
and invest in those that have helped you. It may not be to give them a job like my dad did, but at least you can stop by their house and say thank you. You can invite them over, or you can do something kind for their family. This is what David did in the scripture. His best friend, Jonathan, was killed in a battle. Jonathan was the one that really looked after David. When his father, King Saul, was trying to kill David, Jonathan would get inside information and sneak over and give it to his friend David. Years after Jonathan's death, now David is the king. David asked his assistant, is anyone from the house of Jonathan still alive? If so, I want to do something good for them. They said, he has one son that's crippled, but he's still alive. This son was living in extreme poverty, no future to speak of. David had them go get the young man, bring him to the palace. He looked him in the eyes and said, listen, from now on, you're going to eat at my dinner table every night. From now on, you're going to live in the palace with me, treated like royalty. The young man was amazed. He asked, what did I do to deserve all this? David said, your father was a friend of mine. Your father helped me get to where I am. Now I'm going to show you honor. I'm going to show you respect because of who your father was. <laughs> David could have taken the easy way out and said, I'm going to build you a house down the road, have somebody take care of you. You go off and live a good life. No, David understood this principle, that the greatest gift he could give was himself. David gave that young man his time, his attention, his friendship. The truth is, none of us got to where we are on our own. It's easy to find fault with the people that raised us. I hear it all the time. Joel, my parents didn't treat me right. My father worked all the time. He was never there. My mother had issues. My teachers, they didn't really invest in me. No, they may not have been perfect, but they made sacrifices so that you could go further. Most likely, they did the best that they could with what they had. I was talking to a friend recently. He was the star football player in high school. He loved sports, but his father never came to one game, never saw him play one time. But this son wasn't bitter. He said, Joel, my dad was a good man. He spent all of his time and energy working to provide for the family. That's how he showed love. Come to find out, his father was raised without a father. He'd never seen a father modeled. Didn't really know what he was supposed to do. Sometimes we judge people by what we know instead of by what they know. This son was smart enough to realize his father didn't know any better. He was doing the best that he knew how. Now this son takes his father to all of his grandson's football games. They sit together in the stands and enjoy each other's company. What am I saying? Don't make excuses for why you don't need to see a loved one. Don't live bitter because you didn't get what you needed. Well, Joel, they didn't treat me right. They didn't make me feel important. They should have spent more time with me. Why don't you have a bigger point of view? Maybe they did the best that they knew how. After all, that's your family. That's your flesh and blood. That's the one God ordained to be in your life. You didn't just come from any parents. God handpicked your parents. He knew what they would have and what they wouldn't have. He knew what they could give you and what they couldn't give you. It's easy to focus on the negative, but Keep the right perspective. They're the ones that changed your diapers. They're the ones that fed you, clothed you, stayed up late at night when you didn't feel well. They're the people that when you were a baby, you spit up on them, and they shook it off and gave you another bottle. Now what have you done for them lately? Have you invited them out to dinner? Have you stopped by the house to enjoy their company, to talk about old times, to laugh together? What if they weren't going to be around next year at this time? What if the next few months was the only chance you had to let them know how you feel, what they mean to you? Are you allowing your work schedule too busy to keep you from it? Or maybe have you not spoken in years because you don't get along anymore? You're at odds and you're just letting it ride. Maybe one day 
you'll make things better. God is saying, today is your one day. Reach out to the people that have sacrificed for you. Go visit that family member. You have a gift that they need. And it's not necessarily just your money, your clothes, your food. The gift you have is yourself, your friendship, your time, your love, your hug, your smile, your gratitude. Don't keep putting it off. Do what you know you need to do. Last week, I was flipping through the obituaries, my favorite thing to do. I saw this picture of a man about my age. He always waited on me at the department store. Just saw him a couple months ago in the back of the store. I was in a hurry, but I took a few moments to go over and shake his hand, see how he was doing. Just a two-minute friendly conversation, no big deal. I never dreamed that would be the last time I ever saw him. He had been there for years. Friends, life is short. Don't miss these opportunities to give the gift of yourself. I was so glad that at least I took time to go say hello. When I saw his picture, while I was saddened to know that he was gone, I was satisfied knowing that I had taken the time to let him know that I cared, that he was important to me. My question is, the people God put in your life, your family, your friends, those that you interact with, if they were gone tomorrow, would you be satisfied that they know how much you love them, what you mean to them? Have you seen them lately? Express your feelings taking time to enjoy their friendship, laugh together? If not, why don't you do it sooner than later? I've been to too many funerals where I hear people say, if I only had another chance, if I could just really tell them what they meant to me, this is your other chance. Look around this week. Don't take the people God put in your life for granted. When you give the gift of yourself, your time, your attention, your love, you're keeping the accounts full. When somebody goes to be with the Lord, while you'll still be sad, you'll have no regrets. There'll be a satisfaction knowing they knew exactly how much you loved them, how much you valued them in your life. What makes losing a loved one much more difficult is when we have all these things we wish we would have done. I wish I would have gone to see them. I wish I would have taken my friends. Or I wish I would have forgiven them and made things right. Talked to a young lady just recently. She's dealing with all this guilt, all this remorse, because she got at odds with her father. They had not spoken in a long, long time. Her father, in his early 50s, was suddenly killed in an accident. She said, Joel, I can't handle it. I'm dealing with all this guilt. How do I let it go? Of course, God will give you the grace to do it, but the point I'm making today is it's much better to keep the accounts full. You've heard the saying, live every day like it could be your last. Another good thought, live every day like it could be your loved one's last. Because when you die, if you know the Lord, you're going to go to heaven. You're not going to miss us. There's no time in heaven. The next thing you know is we'll be there. The difficulty is not when you die, but when a loved one dies. That's when people have too many regrets. I've heard it said, if you only had an hour to live, who would you call? What would you say? And what are you waiting for? It was a Thursday night 13 years ago. I was home sound asleep in my bed, and I heard the phone ringing. I woke up in a daze, looked at the clock. It was 4 o'clock in the morning answered the phone, and it was my father. He said, Joel, I'm not feeling well. I need to go up to the clinic to take dialysis. Can you take me? I said, sure, I'll be there in just a moment. I'd gotten in bed that night at 2 o'clock, just had a couple of hours of sleep. Picked my father up and got him to the dialysis center. Most of the time, once he got all hooked up, he would go to sleep. And so I would leave and go to work or go back home and come pick him up four hours later. And this morning, I was particularly tired, but something down in here said, Joel, you need to stay and visit with your dad today. It just felt right. I knew I was supposed to do it, so I pulled up a chair, and for the next three or four hours, my father and I just sat there and talked and laughed, had a good time together. 
He got finished about 8 in the morning, and I took him home, and I was standing in my parents' kitchen, just about to leave, and my father called me back over. He gave me a big hug and said, Joel, you're the best son a father could ever hope to have. And I left that day feeling extremely satisfied. I knew how much my father loved me, and he knew how much I loved him. What I didn't realize was later that day, he would have a heart attack and go to be with the Lord. The last thing I remember him saying to me was what a good son I was. The last thing he remembers me doing for him was spending that three or four hours together. And while I still miss my dad, I have no regrets. There's nothing I wish I would have done differently, nothing I wish I would have said. I'm at peace. And I don't say that to brag on me, but rather to challenge us to make sure we're keeping the accounts full. Make sure you're not putting things off, thinking, yeah, one day I'm going to go see them. One day I'm going to take my grandchildren. One day, I'm going to forgive and make things right. Let today be your one day. Take time for the people God put in your life. Don't cheat them out of the best of you. Your friendship, your love, your smile, your hug, that's one of a kind. Nobody else can give it. If you'll learn to give the gift of yourself, then your accounts will stay full. You'll have no regrets. The people in your life will not only be better, but you will be better. I believe and declare you will live a blessed, happy, fulfilled, victorious life in Jesus' name. If you receive it, can you say amen today? Well, we never like to close our broadcast without giving you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me? Just say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. Come into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. Friends, if you prayed that simple prayer, we believe you got born again. Get in a good Bible-based church. Keep God first place. He's going to take you places that you've never dreamed of. God desires to do something bold in your life, bigger and better than you can even imagine. He wants to make your bold dream a beautiful reality. Step out in faith so He can bless you as you live a bold, confident, overcoming life. This month, Joel and Victoria would like to send you a copy of Living Boldly as a thank you for your support of this ministry. God's got a big plan for your life, so take the limits off of Him. Dream big, ask big, and then expect Him to do big things in your life. Jesus said, according to your faith, it will be done unto you. God will meet you at the level of your expectation. Request this resource. It'll help you to live a big life. And thanks so much for being with us today. We appreciate your prayer, your support, and a special thank you to our Champion of Hope partners for all you do to make the ministry possible. To request your copy of Living Boldly, visit us online or call us toll free. God sees every dream and desire you have in your heart. In spite of how things may look, it's never too late for God to fulfill His promises for your life. As a thank you for your support of our ministry this month, Joel and Victoria would like to send you a copy of Dream It, Pursuing God's Promises for Your Life. First you dream it, then you believe it, then you live it. God wants to give you the desires of your heart, whether it's for someone you love, maybe better health, or even a better job. If you'll put Him first and trust Him, He'll do amazing things in your life. I know this resource will be a great help to you. I hope you'll request one today. I'm so excited about my new book, Every Day of Friday, How to Be Happier Seven Days a Week. It's number one on the New York Times list. It's helping many people. I know it'll be a blessing to you and your friends. Pick up a copy. And thank you so much for watching today, for your prayers and support, and a special thanks to our Champion of Hope partners for all you do to make the ministry possible. Request your copy of Dream It Today. Also, as a special offer this month, we'd love for you to receive Joel's new book, Every Day of Friday. Visit joelosteen.com or call us at 1-888-567-JOEL today. Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We love you. And 
We know God has great things in store. If you're ever in our area, please stop by and be a part of one of our services. I promise you we'll make you feel right at home. But thanks so much for tuning in, and thank you again for coming out. And I'd like to start with something funny. And I heard about this hillbilly family. They had never left their small town, never watched television, never listened to the radio, and they decided to take a vacation to New York City. The first day, the father took his son to see a famous skyscraper. And they were so impressed. They were especially intrigued by the elevator. They didn't even know what it was. And this very old woman walked up and punched the button. The walls opened up. She stepped into a room, and then the walls closed back up. They sat there contemplating what they had just seen. About that time, the walls opened back up and out stepped a beautiful 24-year-old woman. <laughs> Almost in disbelief, the son said, Dad, what just happened? The dad said, I don't know, son, but go get your mother. <laughs> Hold up your Bible. Say it like you mean it. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess, my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, God bless you. I want to talk to you today about how God will cause you to remain. The word remain means to be fixed, immovable, not affected by circumstances. In life, we all have ups and downs. There are seasons that are more difficult than others, seasons of testing, trials, temptation, where our character is being developed. We're proving to God what we're made of. You may be dealing with a boss that's hard to get along with, raising a difficult child, or perhaps just when you thought you would get ahead, you had an unexpected crisis, and now you had to start all over. It's like you took two steps forward and then three steps backwards. If we're not careful, we'll think that all of life is going to be this way, up and then down like a roller coaster. Everything may be fine now, but don't get your hopes up. It's not going to last. Something else is going to go wrong. No, God wants to bring us to a place of stability where we cannot be moved. And Jesus said in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit and your fruit will remain. God is saying, if you'll just keep abiding in me, Keep being your best. Keep being faithful, giving, loving, serving. Then you will come to a place where life is not all ups and downs, one good break and two bad breaks. No, God will cause you to remain. In other words, God won't let you go backwards. He won't let you be defeated. The attacks may come, but God has you fixed. You are stable. You are established. At one time, you would have gone in reverse. But because you've been faithful year after year, you had a setback, but you didn't get discouraged. People were talking about you, but you stayed on the high road. Your plans didn't work out, but you gave God praise anyway. Because you passed this test, it's like you hit this tipping point where God says, all right, you've done your part. You've abided in me. Now I'm going to do my part. I'm going to set you on high. I'm going to take you out of the enemy's reach. I'm going to hide you under my wings. I'm going to make you immovable, unshakable, untouchable. And yes, the enemy may do his best, but his best will never be enough. God has the final say. And when God says, I want you to remain, all the forces of darkness cannot bring you down. No sickness, no person, no bad break, no injustice, no company will be able to take you backwards. You've come into this new season where the creator of the universe says, no more roller coaster rides for you. No more two steps forward and three steps backwards. I'm establishing you. I'm setting you on high. I'm gonna cause you to remain. This is what happened to Joseph. As a young man, he was wearing the coat of many colors. He had God's favor. He was up. Then his jealous brothers threw him into a pit. He went down. He was sold into slavery and went to work for a man named Potiphar. He came back up. Potiphar's wife lied about him and had him put in prison. He went back down. He was good to the people in prison. Pharaoh put him in charge over all of Egypt. He came back up again. Year after year, it was up and down. Good break, bad break. Promotion, setback. But Joseph understood this principle. The whole time, 
He just kept abiding. He didn't get bitter. He didn't start saying, God, why is this happening to me? He just kept passing the test. One day, he hit that tipping point where God said, all right, Joseph, you've done your part. You've proven that you're going to be faithful. I'm going to do my part. I'm going to cause you to remain. And we talk a lot about the ups and downs that Joseph went through, how he kept a good attitude during tough times, and that's important. But what I want us to see today is Joseph came to a place where he never went back down again. God established him. God set him on high. The same God that brought you up can keep you up. Don't get set in your thinking that life's going to be all ups and downs, one good break and one bad break. No, keep abiding. Keep being faithful. And you too are going to come to that place where God not only lifts you up, but God's going to keep you up. Think about Job. He went through a lot of heartache and turmoil. He had setbacks in his health, in his finances, in his family. He practically lost everything. Job's the poster child for a difficult, unfair life. You hear people talking about poor old Job. But what we don't always realize is that that difficulty didn't spread out over Job's entire lifetime. Didn't last year after year. Most experts agree that that trouble lasted for a period of nine months, less than a year. And when it was over and Job came out with twice what he had before, you never read about Job going through major heartache and trouble like that again. Here's the key. In the difficulty, Job didn't get bitter. He didn't start complaining. He just kept abiding. He stayed in faith. And one day, God said, all right, Job, you passed the test. I let the enemy do his best, but you've proven that you will be faithful. Now, I'm going to take you out of the enemy's reach. That kind of heartache and pain is over. I'm going to set you in a place where you remain, where you cannot be touched. You too may have had a lot of ups and downs in life, struggles in finances, difficulties in a relationship. Maybe you battled with depression. These difficulties have lasted year after year, and you're thinking, is it ever going to get easier? Is it ever going to change? Am I ever going to see a breakthrough? The answer is yes. Because you keep abiding in him, just like Job, just like Joseph, you're going to come in to promotion, to restoration, to vindication, where God not only lifts you up, but God's going to keep you up. When I took over for my parents 12 years ago, at first it was very difficult. I had never ministered before, and it was a struggle to prepare a message and to learn how to get up and speak in front of people. Then the church began to grow, and we needed a larger facility. We set out on our three-year journey to try to acquire this place, the former compact center. It was up and down, a victory and a defeat. Just when we thought we had won the battle, a company filed another lawsuit to try to keep us from moving in. We had to start all over. And with the growth came more notoriety. More people were watching. That's both a blessing and a burden. It means there's more scrutiny, more criticism, more people examining every decision. For the first 10 years or so, I was just fighting the good fight, growing, stretching, doing my best to stay above water. It was a struggle. But about two years ago, I remember it like yesterday, I felt this weight lift off of me. It wasn't anything bad. It was just an underlying pressure of what's going to happen next. Is it going to work out? Are the funds going to come in? What are people saying? That all lifted off of me. It was like I stepped into a place where God said, all right, Joel, you've been faithful. You've passed the test. Yes, you've had ups and downs, people for you and against you, but I'm bringing you into a place of stability where you are out of the enemy's reach, where you cannot go backwards. David said in Psalm 27, in the day of trouble, God will hide me in his shelter. He will set me out of reach high upon a rock. And if you'll just keep being faithful, you will come to the place where God will make you untouchable, invisible to the enemy. He will hide you away. You'll have a strength, a confidence, a rest, a knowing greater than you've ever had before. Challenges may come your way, but you're not worried about it. You know it can't touch you. No weapon formed against you can prosper. People may be talking, trying to make you look bad, but you don't give it the time of day. You know your future is too bright to be distracted. 
you know they don't control your destiny. God does. So you just keep on being your best, walking in integrity, stay on that high road, and Almighty God will establish you. It doesn't mean that we won't have challenges, and certainly attacks will come, but it's no big deal. We know that God will take care of our enemies. Many of you today are about to come into this place where God is going to cause you to remain. Because you keep abiding in Him, you're not going to have to face the same struggles that have dogged you year after year. You're not going to have to deal with the same challenges that have held you back for so long. The sickness, the depression, the addiction, the barely getting by, the bad breaks. No, it's a new day. God is saying to you what He said to Moses in Exodus 14, 13. The enemy that you see today, you will see no more. That addiction... That addiction that's sidetracked you for so long is about to be broken. Yeah. You will see it no more. Yeah. That sickness, that depression that you thought would never go away is about to come to an end. You will see it no more. That legal problem, that conflict is not going to last forever. You need to look at the enemies in your life, the things that are holding you back, the struggle, the lack, the unfair circumstances. And instead of thinking, oh, man, it's never going to change, just more of the same. No. Have a new perspective. Look at those challenges and say goodbye. So long. Adios. The creator of the universe is setting me on high. He's making me untouchable. He's taking me out of the enemy's reach. Have that attitude. I will see you no more. It goes on to say you won't have to lift one finger in your defense. For the Lord your God will fight for you. I have a friend that's struggled with a, an addiction for a long time, for many years. In high school, he got mixed up with the wrong crowd, and some 20 years later, he was still addicted. He's a good man, has a good family, he's gone through a lot of counseling, different treatment centers, with no success. And I prayed for him here at the altar several times. He could have easily just given up, thought, well, this is just my lot in life. It's never going to change. Very often, we settle for less than God's best. When it's not happening on our timetable, and we don't see anything changing, it's easy to get complacent and to quit believing, to quit trying. But not this young man. He was determined. He had a made-up mind. And even though he would fall, he would get back up again and again. About two years ago, he told me how after being addicted for 21 years, now he's totally free. I congratulated him, and I, I asked him how he did it. I thought maybe he went through some kind of special treatment program. But he said, Joel, I didn't do anything new. In fact, I can't really put my finger on it. It's just like something broke on the inside. All of a sudden, I didn't have the desire anymore. I had a strength that I'd never felt. What's interesting is, in years past, he could stop for two or three weeks, but then he would crave that drug so strongly, he would always go back to it. He couldn't resist the temptation. But he said, this time, I'm not even tempted by it anymore. It's not even a struggle. That's God establishing him. That's God taking him out of the enemy's reach. You may fall. You may have some setbacks. But if you'll just keep getting back up, one day the God that helped you up is going to keep you up. You're going to hit that tipping point where God's going to cause you to remain. You may have enemies that you've dealt with and they've held you back for a long time. But the good news is those enemies are not permanent. That addiction is not going to defeat you all of your life. It's coming to an end. That struggle, that barely getting by, never having enough, that lack is not going to dog you all of your days. Don't accept it as the norm. You keep abiding, and it's just a matter of time. God promises one day you will see that enemy no more. I know a young lady. She's a single-parent mother and really sharp girl, and she's got her college degree, and She's working hard and raising her family, doing her best to provide a living, but she's always struggled in her finances. At the end of every month, she would barely have enough to pay her bills. And she told how she wanted to take her children on vacation, but every time she saved up extra funds, something would break that would have to be fixed. It was like she just couldn't get ahead. But again, she didn't get discouraged. She didn't start complaining. She just kept being faithful kept being productive, kept honoring God. She's one of our faithful volunteers. I see her here all the time, giving, serving, helping others. What's she doing? Abiding. 
God says, when you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. Not only that, your fruit will remain. That means not temporary favor, but permanent favor. Not a season of blessing, but a lifetime of blessing. Because you keep abiding in him, God won't let you live a life of constant struggle. About four years ago, her supervisor at work unexpectedly took an early retirement, and she was given that position. With that position came an incredible increase in her salary. She was very grateful. About a month ago, she told me how one of the vice presidents of their company suddenly resigned, and she was given that position. She said, Joel, now I'm making more than 10 times what I made when I first started. Today, she doesn't live under that constant pressure. She has more than enough. She can take vacations whenever she wants to, plus she supports another single parent family. That's what God wants to do for you. He wants to set you on high. You may be in tough times. You may be struggling, but don't let that spirit of lack get on the inside. That is not who you are. You're a child of the Most High God. God has much fruit for you to bear. He has an abundance in store for you. And if you will be your best right where you are and be faithful with what you have, then you're going to come in not to a temporary season, but to a permanent place where that enemy of lack you will see no more. It won't be up and down, barely get by. You need to wave goodbye to those days. It says in Deuteronomy, God is bringing you into a good land, a land with no shortage where you will lack nothing. You may have some lack in your life right now, but the good news is that's not where you're staying. God's bringing you into a land with no lack, with no shortage, no defeat, no mediocrity, where you will have more than enough, where you can be a blessing to others. Not two steps forward, three steps backwards. No, God's going to lift you up and he's going to keep you up. He's going to cause you to remain. Friends, God controls the whole universe. Like with this young lady, God can move somebody out of the way so that you can have that position. Quit worrying about who's in front of you. God knows how to get you to where he wants you to be. Promotion doesn't come from people. Promotion comes from the Lord. I know this man who's kind of upset because his boss was really against him. He's always trying to make him look bad and would never give him any kind of credit, any kind of recognition. The truth is, his boss was jealous of him. He was afraid he might get promoted over him. But this man just kept being his best, working under God, not working under people. Several promotions that he should have received because of this unfair boss and his tainted views toward him, he was passed over. One day, the CEO of the large corporation was in town, and this man had to make a sales presentation. The CEO was very impressed with his work. About a year later, a position became available that should have gone to his boss, but the CEO bypassed his boss and called him directly and offered him the position. Today, instead of having to work for the unfair boss, the tables have turned. The boss is working for him. One touch of God's favor, and you'll go from the back to the front, from the tail to the head, from the employee to the employer. Keep abiding. Keep being faithful. Stay on that high road, and you won't have to lift one finger in your defense, for the Lord will fight your battles. God will make your wrongs right. God will get you to where he wants you to be. And God knows not only how to lift you up, God knows how to keep you up. This is what happened to a man in the scripture by the name of Hezekiah. This enemy was coming against him, causing him all kinds of trouble, trying to keep him from his destiny. But again, Hezekiah didn't get all upset and worried and complaining. He just kept abiding, kept being faithful, kept passing the test. In 2 Kings 19, God said, Hezekiah, I myself will come against this enemy. He will receive word that he's needed at home, and I will cause him to want to return, and he will be defeated. Notice, when you abide in him, the creator of the universe says, I myself will come against your enemies. I myself will come against that sickness. I myself will come against those that oppose you. It says, God caused his enemy to want to do something. God can cause that unfair boss to take an early retirement. God can cause that neighbor that's given you so much trouble to decide to pack up and move to another subdivision. 
Not mine, Lord. God can cause that classmate that's saying derogatory things about you to suddenly be transferred to another school. God is in complete control, not just of your life. God is even in control of your enemies. And yes, there may be a few ups and downs, but what I want us to get in our spirit today is God is bringing you into a place where he's going to set you on high, where he's going to take care of your enemies. When it's all said and done, you will never be the victim. He will always cause you to be the victor. Receive that into your spirit. Now, I know some of you, you've been doing the right thing for a long time, faithful year after year, but you haven't seen much progress and not much is going your way. But let me encourage you, your time is coming. God sees every right decision, every sacrifice, every injustice, and at some point you will come out of the test and into the reward. Scripture talks about if you just keep doing the right thing, then payday is coming. Now you can't get stuck in a rut thinking it's never going to change. If you accept the fact that life is always going to be ups and downs, you get negative and bitter, it will limit what God can do in your life. You may have some bad breaks, but you've got to learn to just shake it off. Like this man I heard about, he was going skydiving for his first time. The instructor said there's only three things you need to remember. Number one, when you jump, pull the ripcord for your parachute. Number two, if it doesn't open, pull the emergency ripcord. And number three, the truck will be there to pick you up when you land. He jumped out of the plane so excited, and he pulled the first ripcord, and the parachute didn't open. He frantically pulled his emergency ripcord, and that parachute didn't open. He said, oh, great, and with my luck, the truck probably won't even be there to pick me up. <laughs> but when we have bad breaks, it's easy to expect more of the same. You've got to learn to just shake that off. Things may come against you, but it's not over until God says it's over. Our attitude should be, I may be down, but I'm coming up. This difficulty didn't come to stay, it came to pass. It's not my final destination. God's bringing me into a good land. I know one day this difficulty I will see no more. Second Chronicles chapter 14, there was a king named Asa. It talks about how King Asa did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. He removed all of the idols, and he encouraged the people to worship God. He lived by example, a life of faith and integrity, and honored God with his life. Up to that point, the people of Judah had fought battle after battle. They were constantly on edge, struggling, working, fighting off this enemy and then another. But when King Asa took over and honored God in a greater way and got rid of the things that were displeasing, the Scripture says that no one tried to make war against King Asa, for the Lord was giving him rest from his enemies. When you put God first place, and like King Asa, you get rid of anything that's displeasing, wrong attitude, wrong friends, bad habits. If you will honor God with your life, you will come to a place where God will give you rest from your enemies. It says no one came against him. Some of you have struggled in your finances for many years, but receive this into your spirit. God is going to give you rest from that enemy of lack. Because you've abided in him, God has much fruit coming your way. He has an abundance in store. You may have struggled with the sickness for a long time. You've just learned to live with that pain. But take heart today. God is saying he is going to give you rest from that enemy. It is not permanent. Don't believe those lies that are telling you, I'm never going to get better. I'm never going to get well. I'll never overcome this problem. No, the creator of the universe is going to give you rest from everything that's holding you back. Let me declare it. Rest from depression. Rest from sickness and disease. Rest from addictions and bad habits. Rest from poverty and lack. You need to get up every day and say, Father, thank you that this sickness is not going to defeat me. You're giving me rest. Father, thank you that these addictions are not going to ruin my life. You're giving me rest. Lord, thank you that this legal problem, this conflict is not going to last forever. You promised to give me rest. The scripture says his yoke is easy and his burden is light. God doesn't want you to go through life constantly struggling, always burdened down, fighting against something. Yes, you may have seasons that are more difficult where you have to really stand strong, but don't settle there 
and accept that as the way it's always going to be. No, God is bringing you into a good land, a land with no shortage, not two steps forward and three steps backwards. No, keep abiding, keep being faithful, and you're going to hit that tipping point where God says, all right, that's enough. They passed the test. That's my son. That's my daughter. I'm going to cause them to remain. God's not only going to lift you up, he's going to keep you up. He's going to make you immovable, untouchable to the enemy. I know some of you have struggled in a certain area for a long time, but remember what God said to Moses. He's saying it to you. The enemy you see today, you will see no more. God is doing a new thing. I believe even right now chains are being loosed and bondages are being broken. Setbacks are going to turn around to being comebacks. If you'll just keep abiding in him, you're not going to have to lift one finger in your defense. God is going to give you rest from your enemies. He's going to set you on high. And I believe and declare you will fulfill your destiny and you will become everything that God's created you to be. Amen. Do you receive it today? We never like to close our broadcast without giving you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me? Just say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. Come into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. Friends, if you prayed that simple prayer, we believe you got born again. Get in a good Bible-based church. Keep God first place. He's going to take you places that you've never dreamed of. God sees every dream and desire you have in your heart. In spite of how things may look, it's never too late for God to fulfill His promises for your life. As a thank you for your support of our ministry this month, Joel and Victoria would like to send you a copy of Dream It, Pursuing God's Promises for Your Life. First you dream it, then you believe it, then you live it. God wants to give you the desires of your heart, whether it's for someone you love, maybe better health, or even a better job. If you'll put Him first and trust Him, He'll do amazing things in your life. I know this resource will be a great help to you. I hope you'll request one today. I'm so excited about my new book, Every Day of Friday, How to Be Happier Seven Days a Week. It's number one on the New York Times list. It's helping many people. I know it'll be a blessing to you and your friends. Pick up a copy. And thank you so much for watching today, for your prayers and support, and a special thanks to our Champion of Hope partners for all you do to make the ministry possible. Request your copy of Dream It Today. Also, as a special offer this month, we'd love for you to receive Joel's new book, Every Day of Friday. Visit joelosteen.com or call us at 1-888-567-JOEL today.